2012 meeting of the uh, Finance Committee. Uh, and uh, we'll note, the clerk will note that um, everyone is here except for Council President, who's on his way. Um, and uh, just quickly, we have the minutes of November 22nd, 2011. Move to approve it. Second. Second. Um, any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. And then we have a meeting schedule for 2012, um, uh, which we sort of settled in on this time. Um, this fourth Tuesday at 5. Yep. And I so want to look at that. We will obviously, for every meeting, we'll have to post separately. And, but this at least gives us an outline for our schedules. Yep. And if we have to adjust for anything, yeah. Yeah, I don't have any problem with that. I okay. want to just look at November 27th to see if that's the week that we're following into Thanksgiving. Okay. Is after, that after? It's after Thanksgiving. After? Mm -hmm. yeah. 27th after. Okay. Um, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. We may not be here. So, uh, and then we'll have to, we can decide, um, like in the summer, for example, if for whatever reason, right. if, if we decide July 2nd, whether, or whatever date that is, July 24th or July. August, depending on people's schedules, whether or not we would meet yeah. in August or July, we we'll that a month at a time. Okay, um, then why don't we go ahead, because uh, we don't want to keep Mr. Scanlon waiting and just have you get started. I'm good. Okay. Is there any, do you want to give any introductory remarks, Susan, about our, this is our outside audit of our FY 2011 uh, books that you do, that we've been doing every year now, and then you're going to be giving us our report on that for today. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, three reports. Uh, in front of you, uh, the thicker one is the financial report. Um, probably just want to hit the highlights of that kind of first. So, um, there is, uh, you have to, uh, your statements are kind of issued a little bit differently than years past. Um, the presentation, um, the fund balance, um, it's got on page 17 and 18. This is the first year of uh, GASB 54, which is a reclassification of fund balance. Um, put your fund balances into five categories. Um, Non-spendable, restricted, committed, assigned, and unassigned. Um, Non-spendable kind of speaks for itself. It's uh, the non-spendable portion of trust funds. Uh, restricted and you know, restricted for grants, uh, revolving funds. Also, outside constraints that are restricting it um, to that. And, and assigned, assigned would be like encumbrance, like uh, the lowest form of uh, government, which would be the department head type in release the constraint on it and it'll float it on the side um, on the closeout. It would make up encumbrances. Um, out in the non-major funds assigned would be your ambulance funds and your parking. Um, again, that's more at the department level assigning it for those functions. It's not an exact, well, exact restriction. Like, is that assigned or unassigned? Assigned. Assigned, yeah. yeah. Okay. And then unassigned is you know, free cash, basically. Um, this year's part of the ASB 54 year stabilization funds become part of unassigned general fund. <coughs> so when we look at, at these statements, you keep your books separately under Massachusetts general laws where stabilizations are moved out to a separate fund. When it comes to financial reporting under GAAP purposes, stabilization funds do not meet the definition of special revenue funds. They get reported under general fund. So that's kind of a big... Uh, big change uh, into your statements when you look at them. They don't tie exactly to undesignated fund balance on that you submit for free cash. Uh, some highlights of, uh, of the statements. Um, I like to see the city get a little, build up their reserves. I think your stabilization funds are about 250000 at June 30th. Um, good healthy reserves would be about 5% of uh, your operating costs, and your operating costs around $71 million, I think, is your budget. Uh, You're talking general funds. Sure. Correct. So you'd like to see us have 5% of the general fund. Correct. And that's about $77 million. Yeah, and uh, so roughly about $3.7 million should be in your stabilization and free cash together. Um, I think free cash is around a million, I believe, that's certified now. Um, 
Tom, when you say stabilization and free cash together, you're talk are you talking about the two stabilization accounts or the three? Meaning two Smith stabilization. Smith had kind of by itself just more on the restricted purposes because it really came from the sale of that land. Right. So the, the Smith Folk Stabilization Fund is classified as restricted, not major. Okay. What were the other two? Yep. No. You say 5%, you're talking about 5% of, of the general fund. That, 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 you're not including the enterprise funds in there. No. Okay. Because they have their own reserves and free yep. cash as part in there. Just, I think your operating budget, well, the June, about $76 million. Yeah. Um, so good, healthy reserves, between free cash stabilization combined should be about 5%. Um, so you're talking $3.7 million. Page 21. Um, this is probably the most important statement uh, I think management of, of a city or town government should uh, be familiar with. Um, it's your budget to actual, basically, how you compare to your budgets, which generates your free cash. And I think it's important that every community should know where the free cash is generated from. Um, it's this statement's laid out, uh, your first uh, column is your original budget. That's the original budget you vote in May going into the fiscal year. The final budget is the final budget after all amendments, all transfers have been made, any additions to it, uh, transfers. Uh, third column is the actual basis, your actual expenditures, your actual revenue. The last column is uh, basically where your free cash is generated from. Um, your free cash will certify just around a million. And you can see 700,000 was made up from turn back of appropriations. So about 70% of your free cash is on turn backs of appropriations. Uh, I think it's very important to know that where you're generating your free cash and how you use it. So you shouldn't use your free cash for reoccurring expenses. Um, you should use it for one time, one time issues. Um, I think a bulk of uh, the turn back, kind of a mixture that made up the 700,000, but the state assessments, you see the 173 in the turn back compared to what you budgeted. That's a direct uh, result with the offset under intergovernmental up above on the revenue side. It has to do with charter school. Charter school, they shorted you on the reimbursement, but you budgeted for revenues, and they didn't charge you on the state assessment. So those two kind of offset each other on that one. Um, those kind of the financial uh, highlights, just the schedules, most important ones on, uh, on pages 15 and 16. These are your entity-wide statements. They take into account more like a business. They have depreciation of your buildings built in. It's on a full of cool basis of accounting. These are useful. These are what bonding companies are looking at. Um, all your promises are accounted for on here. Compensated absences, agreements you made if you retire or leave termination will buy back um, your time. So on page 15, I just want to point out, under the governmental activities, under unrestricted, you see it's a negative 5.6 million. The reason why you're showing a negative under uh, that aspect is to, it's a direct result of the OPEB obligation up above on the liabilities. On the general fund, it's 10 million four hundred ninety-five thousand, And the OPEB is the health insurance that you promise to pay a percentage of when they retire um, that you're not funding. Um, it's the same in every community. Um, you know, one aspect is maybe to dump an old pet trust here in the future. Um, another thing is to fund it. But that is a direct result of, and then bonding companies are going to be looking at how you're handling that. Now, the Commonwealth hasn't actually set up a mechanism for us to do that. Under there, have they? they passed uh, Chapter 32, Section 20 to allow you to adopt a trust. Um, they, you still have to live within limits of two and a half to get the money into the trust. Um, I'd like to see him somehow lift that aspect of things. So it's there, but it is, isn't feasibly usable. Correct. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, we have about 72 audits. We have 12 of our clients passed the OPEP trust. We have one that funded it, and they funded it at 10% of their ARC, basically $100,000 to put in. Has the state dealt with theirs yet? 
No. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, I would say it's, it's more of an accounting exercise right now mm -hmm. and recognizing that you have promises you made to your employees that you're not keeping up with. Um, but you also have an unfunded liability and your roads too. I mean, you know, you're everywhere, the world's on a pay as you go. Um, so we kind of balance those two out uh, to realize, you know, we do have reoccurring expenses that we're putting off to the future, which would, would be your old pet. Ten million dollars. Correct. Mm -hmm. That's it. You touched that uh, compensated absences. Yep. Compensated absences. In, in the non-current, just above the OPEP. Yep. There's a non-current and a current portion. Yep. Uh, the current portion is 1.2. The sick time is made up of the non-current and big. Sorry. The sick time is made up of the current portion, and the non-current portion is the vacation time. Okay. Okay. Yep. I think there's there's, uh, there's another category in there. I can't remember. There's sick vacation um, and it's other. Like yeah. What about comp? Yeah, that's the other category. Okay. And again, those are if you leave employment, you've made a promise to buy back a certain force another time. Yeah. And that's all. So this statement kind of looks at cumulative to you. It uh, takes your debt into consideration. Again, if you're borrowing for operating costs, you would see that unrestricted going to a negative, which you're, you're not. You can see if you, if you strip the OPEP obligation out of there, it puts you back into the positive of five million. And it, it, it's, it's important to know if when you're meeting with movies and you're honoring companies and what you're doing about it. Um, Could you talk a little bit about that landfill closure? Yep, the landfill closure liability that's uh, 4.2 million, that's your estimated liability, what's going to cost to close your landfill. It gets updated every two years that FAM form you fill out. Um, that's what we think it's, and then again, it's based on no time um, value, um, as pointed out. Uh, actually, you can see the landfill fund on page 23 kind of breaks out those enterprise funds more fully instead of one column. Four point two million to close that. Yeah. <clears throat> Actually, the, the, a lot of that is all based on a lot of assumptions. Is that correct? Right? So, is there? You don't have time with this four point two million is no longer correct. Uh, this you get this number from us or correct? Okay. Correct. It's a it's a report you file with DEP every yep. two years. And they're okay. going to update it this spring, I believe. Uh, so that number will change come this spring. Okay. Uh, and it's in it's in the ballpark of it. And again, it also in this landfill column is your trust fund that you have that you put money away for landfill closure. That's all factored in under the landfill trust. So you can see total unrestricted is not in the negative. Um, so you, you you are providing for that closure. And you, now this is the page that they they, they do the basis for, for our, our bond rating. Uh, the, the NDY statements up front. Yeah. Yeah. They look they look at that to see on your unrestricted piece why you're going into a negative. If it's OPEB, they know what it is. Uh, if if you're in the negative, say like by 20 million, your OPEB liability is 10 million. That's telling them that you're borrowing either for costs for operating costs. So this is a good <coughs> useful over time. Yeah. Um, again, if you borrow money and you put it to your buildings, the assets on the up on top is offsetting the liability, so you have no effect on your bottom line. Um, so yeah, they are looking at it. It's on a full accrual if you, your taxes are growing. Um, yeah. Again, you're recognizing allowance accounts on that on this statement. Who borrows for operating costs? We have a few. Uh, I didn't know that you were actually allowed to. Well, you get it doesn't mean you get taken off by the state. I mean, it's just a matter of here. How do you find to get yeah. on for yeah. operating expenses? So. Usually you get that borrowing from the state of Springfield. I think had a $50 million borrowing uh, a couple years ago. I think uh, you know, the emergency borrowing from the state. That's no time surely borrowing for operating costs. Got it. <laughs> okay. It's not a good indicator. Yeah. No, you can see that in the negative there. Yeah, 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 it's not a good thing. Correct. I had pulled uh, a lot of the bond ratings 
I was trying to make right a reason that all of them across the state was almost impossible. Uh, they just calibrated um, last spring. So if you're going back before last spring, it's going to be very hard to link the, the two together because they did. Right. Um, Maybe that's point. my problem. I, I'm trying to put two of them together. Yeah. Okay. And it, I look at some of these that have fantastic bond ratings, and it's like Lowell, um, you know, in Lexington. Well, Lowell, and they believe, I, I can't, it's not the auditor of Lowell, but I believe they are in state qualified bonds and they get the bond rating of the state. Huh, okay. Um, that explains it. Yeah, and two, it uh, depends what you're looking at. Um, they, can, they can buy qualified bonds, they pay a higher interest rate, they buy, they buy a premium, get a better yep. bond rating for out in the market. So I don't know what you're exactly looking at. Um, okay, and they have like $2.6 million worth of long term debt. Well, it's, well, that's why the state. That's why. Right. Oh, yes. yes. yeah. But I was trying to put all of them together, and it just wasn't working out. So there, there's probably a difference between the two. Yeah, the standard of course, and there's Moody's. I don't know who's rating them. Yeah. Um, I don't know what. Those Moody's. Those Moody's. Yeah. Moody's. Um, yeah, I'm the, I want to see what you're looking at. There's different. Yeah, it's, it's just the at a glance stuff out of, out of the DORs. <clears throat> it's tough to do. Yeah. It's very tough to do. Um, to put After about six hours, I gave up. Yeah, it's it's it's. We we tried comparing some of our cities and towns. Um, it was hard to do. Yeah. You know, it's hard to do on free cash too. A lot of people will compare cities and towns on free cash, but yeah, I have, I have two towns that borrow each other. And I was saying, well, the town next to us has five million free cash, and we have a million. It's like, well, they you have capital costs all built into your budget, and you're utilizing your receipts and offsetting it. They're not, and sure. then they're taking their free cash and they're buying capital with it. So you have the same free cash when you get to the end. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, bond rating comes. With bond ratings are hard to. You really have to. Those are something that's defined to your city. So what's a mixed bag? If we say we need five percent of our our budget for free cash, it, uh, that's a mixed signal too. Yeah, I mean, you have to look at your whole. I mean, that would drive your rating up. Um, yeah. You know, with reserves, what they look at. Yeah. Um, what are you doing about old cap? Help increase your bond rating. Yeah, I know there's a lot more involved in it than just having $2 million in your free cash account. Correct. There's reasons why it's there or why it's not there. It's correct. Not, not paid off something yet that we should have. Or correct. Yeah. Okay. You know, what, what percentage of your debt do your budget are? Yeah, you're a little below 10%, you're above 10%. Yeah. Okay. No, but your statement is confined to our finances. Right. 5%. Correct. In our financial reality. Correct. Would result in an excellent. Correct. Be a right. wonderful thing. Yes. Oh, that, and that's the same message we got from Moody's in our, mm -hmm. our bond rating was mm -hmm. that yeah. we're not yeah. going to maintain that bond rating unless they see reserves start to increase. So, And they did give us a, a three-page comparison of other, um, they took all of the um, communities that they rate who had a similar bond rating as us and then they gave us factors, free cash, capital, and everything. That, that would be more useful if you can get that from. Yeah, I have that. Yeah, that's why I brought it because I have it. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, the one from the state and comparing everyone, yeah, that will make you drink. Yeah. <laughs> Confusing. Yeah. Yes. And then, you know, one one other, I think I just want to point out, because there's always a question after uh, people that look on page 16. That's kind of the operating statement of NDY. Um, and when you go under employee benefits under operating contributions of 8.1 million, that is an on behalf payment. Um, we call it a ghost phantom revenue, phantom expense. Those are the mass teachers, they make a contribution instead of giving you the money, they make a contribution for your grants to the state. So that 8.1 million is also a revenue under employee benefits and insurance. So that's always a common question to me. It's like, what do we get for 8.1 million for our health insurance? So that, that's a, a GASB requirement that you have to show on behalf payments on your financials. And it, that's one of the main differences. You know, when you look, uh, when you compare it in your budget versus actual between pages 18 and 21 on uh, your employee benefits and insurance, you can see the actual expenditures on the budget side on page 21 is 14.8 million. 
And on page 18, employee benefits and insurance is 22.8 million. The difference is that 8 million is the on behalf payments. Um, and we show it up above on intergovernmental on behalf, the 8 million. Now that 25 million, that includes the schools, correct? Correct. So they're, they're on, their benef benefits are on the city side. Correct. So if anybody has questions like on the financial, if you go through it, um, give me a call. Those are kind of like the highlights I just used to uh, hit on. If any kind of questions you have on it, go on some things. In the last year's, your, the management letter, Yep. everybody is getting smaller. There's a page nine in last year's and not in this year. <laughs> yeah. yeah, like five. Yeah. Five or six years ago, it was as thick as the other report. I know. <laughs> it's getting better. <laughs> but it used to used to change the covers every year, so it was easy for me to know which one was. Oh, really? But now you've got the exact same cover this year that you had last year, I so know. it'll be confusing on my. You know, you know, I think I think we went from we went from the Irish green to the. I know. The, yeah. So but anyway, on uh, on page nine uh, on your accounting financial policies uh, procedures manual. Yep. Um, is that, I don't know if that's even is, I haven't read this other management letter yet, but it's the city has a preliminary discussions on producing such a manual, and as of the date of our audit, a manual in its entirety does not exist. Yeah. We encourage the city to develop and implement the entire accounting financial policy and procedures manual. We acknowledge that this process will take a good amount of time, and we will help the city to develop a complete manual. Is that? That's from last year. That's yeah, last it's in last year's. And then we updated it into this year. So okay, that's right. I haven't read. I haven't read this new one yet. So. Yeah, no, it's in hot off the presses right now. Okay. We actually fine-tuned it a, a, a little on the findings. We put it under a current finding. Um, a, lot, a lot of the feedback we're getting off of that is like, yeah, 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 how do we, how do we do a whole? We, we have policies and procedures in place, just not documented. Um, so we kind of rewrote it a little bit different way and kind of geared in the places. Um, so do you just want to walk through this then? Yeah, yeah. Number nine, by number? And yeah, we'll walk through the management letter again. It's a, it's a letter of criticism. You never see anything good in a management letter of what the city's doing. Um, you know, I think uh, the city staff, financial staff, uh, they're one of our best, uh, one of our best communities. Um, very easy to work with. Very up to date on uh, finances from Massachusetts. Um, one of our better cities, um, financial reporting wise, and. A lot of people, uh, a management letter automatically equals that your financial reporting, if, if something's common in that means your financial reporting is not good. Um, I think the city's financial reporting is, is, is one of the best. I think it's, I think it's very good. Uh, what I mean by that is that a financial transaction happens in the city, it's accounted for. Um, so if a resident comes in and pays their tax bill, it's flowed through the system all the way to the general ledger and it's reported out in the financial report. Same with it, if the department head incurs an expenditure. Um, so I think uh, you know, that, that's worth noting um, that your financial personnel, I think, are, are doing a great job um, for financial accounting. Um, with that being said, we don't, me being an auditor, I always go to come up with uh, issues, <laughs> I think. Uh, so uh, the first one is parking. Uh, again, we, uh, the past, Last time we looked at parking was three years ago. Um, we we kind of kind of by plan is uh, we want your kiosks to be uh, in place and really look at those because um, again having the kiosk machines that's an important control because there's tapes there there's it's in um, and again the city collects about 1.3 million in parking revenue and about just over uh, 600 thousand in parking tickets. Um, we just feel the city could Im improve their internal controls in, in that regard. Um, again, with the kiosk machine, we couldn't find documentation of the reconciliation on the revenue collected flow to the, uh, the bank deposit. I think that's very important, um, especially with the kiosk machines. With parking meters, it, it's difficult to do. Um, there's not a lot of controls on parking meters. Um, that's why you go to kiosk machines. They run tapes. Again, those tapes should be collected and that those tapes should be stapled and they should be equal to bank deposit. I know um, some unique nuances where bags have to be full, you save on bank service charges, um, 
we would like Susan and everything there sit down and really look at the parking department as a whole and maybe break out some revenues as a flow to your ledger so you can get some better analyticals off it instead of having one revenue parking meter um, and get it right down to the meter, the passes, the parking meters, the kiosks, the specific revenue sources so you can get some good analytics on it. And again, you don't want the same personnel, I mean, you're limited, but you never want the same personnel collecting, making the deposit, and reconciling. So again, management oversight comes in there, and like I said, we, we couldn't find a lot of strong documentation of receipts being collected and making its way to the bank. Not, not saying anything's wrong, but we, those controls should be in place. And that kind of being said, we float it into risk assessment, which is the next one. Uh, and that's really a part of risk assessment. Yeah, involved. and we just want to go, do we want to, we do have a, the city did respond. Oh yeah. So we do have a response. Yeah. And just that, as you all know, I'm in the process of reorganizing the parking department, and this will be one of the issues that will be addressed. So mm -hmm. when, when the parking department is reorganized, these controls will be put in place. So. Yeah, we will help the city, you know, put the revenue categories uh, in place. So, so currently, we don't have a we don't have a tape that that counts the quarters in, in every one of these meters. Oh, you, you, you got them out there. They're just not being yeah, utilized. Well, what now. happens is, um, uh, yeah, the, the machines themselves, um, the, uh, the, the kiosk type machines, they do have a way to generate a tape um, as well as the, the meters, not so much so, but the, the actual kiosk machines. Yeah. So what we want to do is, is get all those things sort of separated out from each other so that we can reconcile them. Little individual cash, yeah. cash yeah. registers. Mm -hmm. right. And um, there was an issue that you were making reference to it that our bank was charging us more if we were the, if we were bringing because what happens is we have to bring all this coinage to the bank in a bag. They charge us a service fee for the counting of it all. You know, they have to bag. For bag. <laughs> yeah. For bag. Uh, that's the counting piece, apparently. It's the deposit and counting Correct. piece of all the change. And so there was an issue where we were, there was an incentive to fill bags. And so some of the deposits, they were bundling them together to get to a full bag. And so, but it was also creating issues. So we're trying to address that as well. And if you want, yeah, because I said, like the main cash registers, you want to, if all the kiosks are out there, they have tapes in, and you go to kiosk one, it's a slip prints out and says $1,000, and the next kiosk says $1,200, and the money's counted, so you have $2,200. Those tapes should flow right into the bank deposit, $2,200. What well, happens? You had to fill bags. So you take some of the parking meters and empty them into the bag. So it, it it destroys the integrity of that control you have on place that cash register. You can never really okay did did the twenty two hundred. I mean, you know, more came in, but these you ruin the integrity of the flow of yeah. the control. There's, there's okay. no documentation system as they withdraw from the meter indicating. It's interesting because I've talked to the guys about it. There's a, the digital meters will give you a readout, but inevitably all of them give false reads. Because they there's some are Canadian coins, Correct. some are American coins that get counted as Canadian coins. There are spider, you know, you get a spider web in there, and Correct. so they would have a readout that would show more money that they took out than the readout showed. Correct. It would show, so it, so that's one of the challenges that they face with the current technology. Yeah. Um, uh, that so that was the issue. Um, and again, our I, mean, on the, on the, I will say on the parking meter side, our revenue has been up. And so, um, so I, you know, it's that's, uh, yeah, no, yeah. So I'm not, as you said, you didn't have any concerns per se, other than just controls. Correct. Exactly. Yeah. So principal concern, controls, accountability. All right. Right. Yeah. Correct. And Tom, the log of the monthly passes. What could you just talk a little bit about that? Yeah. yeah the, the monthly parking passes should they should you should, should eventually get the pre number, and so. Twenty dollars per pass. Let's say and you issued a hundred of them. They, they should be premium hundred. You should have two thousand dollars worth of revenue, um, and that should flow to a separate line item on the general ledger. So everything's accounted. And there should be a log of them. Um, it just wasn't. It's just not a log. Mm -hmm. um, you should try to get them pre-numbered or address the issues in, in that area. How much information do we have on the person that buys the pass? Is that they fill out a, some kind of an application? Check or cash, so yeah. And it's, it's never associated with a particular plate. 
I don't believe so because uh, because there are stores that will buy five of them for their employees. Yes. So, um, mm -hmm. I think it's just the pass. I don't think it's just the yeah, space. I don't think it's linked to a car. It's not linked to a car. It's, yeah. a, it's a placard. It's okay. like the ones we get yep. for city council. So yep. that is another area that I am working to address and yep. put in place controls for that as well. Okay. Um, and, and Tom, you were saying that it would be a good practice for the coming fiscal year to, instead of just having one line item, come into revenue that says parking meter revenue, Correct. separated out into meters, passes, kiosks, and garage revenue? Correct. So you can okay. see, so you can flow over where's my revenue coming from off this, so you can kind of, you do some analytics, so if you start one year, obviously analytics won't happen until two years. So right. you can look at your garage, you see your garage revenue dropping, you say, well, what's going on? What's, what are we looking at here? Yeah. Right. Now you just know it's just parking in general. Um, and if you can really isolate it to Again, there's no over parking meters. That kind of, besides those bags that just drop off in the means that lock right away, that's the only really control over parking meters. That's why kiosks really came about, like many cash registers. Um, you want to try, if you can get the revenue streams, isolate them for parking mm -hmm. meters. Um, your senior borough streams, you can really, you can do a lot with analytics. Right. And that's really it. Right. You know, like, if you make your ledger to that point. And then again, a monthly pass is you get your ledger on a monthly pass. You know, you issue 200 of them. They're $10 a piece, the X amount of revenue. And if you only see this amount of revenue, you know it's an issue. Right. Okay. But do we necessarily need to know where a particular pass is for, for a car? We don't really need to know that. Do we? If we sell 300, we sell 300. Well, the way gonna... that they have been doing it is that they, they do, they make, they print up 300 of them for each month or so on a monthly basis. And they keep them in a folder and they sell them and when they're sold out. So they have some, I mean, they, they, they can tell you that they didn't sell, you know, 27 of them in one month or whatever, but, in ter but you're saying that in terms of keeping that revenue separate, in a separate line item. Yeah, that should be pretty number. I mean, exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. They have to buy it monthly or can for it the, be done yearly? For their passes for long-term parking, it's monthly. The garage passes, you can buy them on a six-month basis. Yeah, uh, um, or it may be, I think it's six-month. You can buy them for a six-month period. Um, yeah, no, I know it's longer than a month. It is, yeah. yeah. So those are more longer. But the, we're talking about the ones that are out here. You can yeah. park in the long term in the 10 hours. So again, this is one of the yeah. another item that we'll be looking at. Um, Could you just, Mayor, explain on this paragraph due to the number of personnel assigned to parking department, there was a lack of segregation duties. The same employee is responsible for collecting. I mean, it's the same old person. What's the big thing about that? What happens is the maintenance guys go out every day uh, on a rotating basis, um, and they collect from different zones of the city. So they empty all the meters, and they empty all the kiosks, and you know, they have all the zones that they do, and they bring it all back to the garage, and they have us, they have a secure area in the basement where they have counting machines that they run all the coins through uh, and, it, and it sorts them and um, puts them, you know, it, it, it breaks them all down into certain amounts and generate, tells you how much you have. They then fill out a slip, a deposit slip, and they bring that over to the collector's office. And then the collector's office, the big Briggs truck shows up every day to collect all the other money that they collect and it takes it away. And I think the point he's making is that probably we should have that money collected and then have it counted by the collector's office or by some by other, someone by, by some someone other just want to break up the one person. Yeah, one person in charge of everything. So that is the um, so they would turn over the money. They would turn over the tapes for the machine. Right. So you want someone reconcile the tapes every time who's counting the money. That's, that makes sense. And so um, and so that's gonna be, that's the what we're going to try to do. In place. Is our policy we have we always have two people collecting the money? Is that, I mean, for their own, I mean, for the for their own benefit. That is my sense of it. Although I cannot, I don't know what would occur on vacation. And the police like department that. used to have a policy; they always had to have two yeah. cops. Um, yeah. And just, I mean, it, it's for their own benefit. Um, yeah, and I believe that's the ideal situation. Yeah. They, they, I, I just saw Brian and Mike out there the other day coming back. So I think there's two people. They usually go out together in a pickup truck and do it. Um, so, but the, uh, your items are they listed according to 
uh, any hierarchical determination? No. Okay, so no. the number one problem is important. No, no. Okay, all right. No, everyone asked me that. Oh, it, question, yeah. Well, it, just just to be safe, because yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. no, they're kind of. And is there any one as you go through this? But is there any one that's you find more critical than all the others? Well, I think this one. This one would be this would qualify. Just because it's a significant revenue stream. Mm -hmm. no, no. Good. Okay. Well, that's right. I needed that. Okay. Thank you. That thought was firing around in my head. Yeah. That, that <laughs> happens. <laughs> <laughs> and so the next one is, is we kind of took last year's and kind of combined two of them, the risk assessment and the policies, procedures, and manual. A lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of the feedback on that from last year's finding was, since we don't have a policies, procedures, and manual, we must have no controls in place. Well, that's not true. You do have policies, procedures in place. You just have to documenting them. Um, and that's more of a, how, how does an expenditure get incurred by a department? Do you have to get a PO first, and that should be all in written form. How do you encumber money? Um, you know, what's your policy on you know, uh, outside departments collecting cash outside of the department? They keep a control log of their balance to the source documents. All those things to reinforce that if you have cash turnover within 30 days. Um, and we kind of, in the fund, we kind of put some areas in place where we thought, you know, risk assessment could uh, benefit the city, uh, cash collected at decentralized locations. Again, you have great controls in place with your, your main revenue streams, your taxes, and your collector's office. Um, and that's what's material to your financial statements. Um, you know, say a department collecting a fee, it's not material to your financial statements, but it's, it's politically sensitive, it's publicly sensitive. Uh, that, you know, if someone's $100 goes missing, it's not material to your financial statements, it's not going to bankrupt you, but it's... Yeah. I was glad to hear you say that we were doing a good job of tracking the money and things like that, because I always thought we had been. Yeah, no one's... And, uh, so nice to hear it. Thank you. Yep. And then, um, obviously, accounts payable. Payroll is always going to be an issue. Risk assessment is always what controls do you have in your payroll. Um, you know, it's overtime. Well, you know, do we have controls in overtime? Same person working overtime. Those, those sort of things on risk assessment um, yeah. in place. It's, as far as drafting the manual, is the boilerplate? Uh, there are boilerplates making its way. Um, I do have a couple I was going to forward over to, uh, to Susan. I, I kind of first ones I hit the, a year ago, um, they were all the same thing, and then so I think they just changed the name across the top. Of course. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but you, of the page or Correct. <laughs> um, they had a few that were, uh, they had water departments in there, they really didn't have a water department, but they had controls in place that they documented their water department. That's always oh. a good one. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there is templates out there. Um, I've been kind of weeding through some good ones to, uh, to give you a base. Um, so yeah, I will kind of formulate it. They're all coming in PDF, so you have to like kind of type it over. Yeah. Well, I wish they saw a program that could break the PDF down to Word. Oh, well, you can. Oh, you can? Oh, yeah. So again, the city's response is that, that the finance director and the auditor will be working to, to, be, to, to work with you to begin development of that. Yeah, we have, we have, we have, we have a couple of checklists. We have a couple, a couple of checklists. Checklist that we use in the auto that we can um, give to you, so you can use as like a base. Um. And then uh, the third one is kind of we, we tell in all our communities. Uh, I think it's going to be an issue. I think three years down the road, when we start it's good. It's really looking to see what controls you have in place. You're aware of the fine um, health insurance proration. You know, by the 12 January 12th. Following the end of the close of fiscal year, you have to send a bill out to communities for retired year. People that come from our communities that retire, um, you know, for the health insurance that retire from you after, for retirees after January 1st, 2011. This year, there are very few. As you get building, um, should have control of the place, maybe receivable. Uh, communications key. They're only giving you six months to get the bill out to other communities. Um, it is going to have a financial impact because other communities can build yourselves. Um, so just give us a hypothetical of how this plays out. Just describe for me. A, uh, a person working for the city of Northampton, they worked, uh, say, at Town Long Metal for 20 years. <laughs> you know anyone like that? <laughs> I, I was like, some Italy, doesn't it? 
She's worked for a lot of towns. Uh, come to see Northampton work and retire. They retired this March. I want to say March 2011. So they retired after January uh, 1st, 2011. And obviously, you're going to pay, the city's going to pay a percentage of that individual's health insurance. X amount. Well, that's going to get prorated to the 20 years back that Long Meadow is going to pay a piece of that. It's going to be billed on a percentage basis. So at the end of the fiscal year, you have to calculate what the cost of that individual's health insurance was and then prorate it back to the other communities, which would be, for instance, say Long Meadow. You would send a bill to Long Meadow that has to be billed by January 12th of 2012. Um, so to be a revenue source for the city, um, that will flow into the general fund. However, communities will be doing it to yourselves, too. Right. Um, like we'll Lyman. leave a 90 10 split. Correct. We'll pay it off. Correct. So you're going to have to have some additional appropriation in there. And also, it's, it's, I haven't found the way to get a good number yet. And maybe through your conversation, Susan, that, you know, with retirement boards, if, if, who knows how many employees, ex employees you have out there that went to other systems that retired between January 1st after January 1st, or are going to retire, what bill you're going to get um, come next year. So that's, that's, that's the fear I have, is not really the revenue. The revenue is good, but what liability do you have out there from your ex-employees that earn time with you that retire from other systems? And you're going to get a bill. That could be 20 years ago. Correct. Mm -hmm. But your proration should be small then, because they've been gone 20 years. We've, we've already, uh, we've sent our first bill, which was for Chris Pyle. Um, so, and we've gotten our first bill, it was for another employee, we got it from East Hampton. Yeah. So, but you know, it raises lots of questions because um, the state service count in this, um, and also uh, what if one community pays 80% and another community pays 50%, um, there's like huge questions around yes. how you actually quantify this. Mm -hmm. What if one community does a family plan or a single plan, but another community does the, um, the uh, what's the, the one that's just family two plus people? One. Or the, yeah, you do the two, you yeah. can do two, two people. We don't offer that plan here. So there's lots of questions, um, but I have HR's handling it, and I know they've told me they've gotten one bill from East Hampton, and yeah. we've sent one bill to Amherst. Who's the final arbiter? Parac, I believe, because Parac, well, yeah, the amended 32B. There's, there's a line of appeal then, if, if something. I mean, we used we had a 90-10 commitment years ago yeah, for our insurance. So no one's no one appealed it yet because the bills are small. You just have one of those files. Do what happens when you have 20? Exactly. Yeah. You know, and what happens? If, you know, I know, I know one of our communities out east, they received a bill for $22,000. Like, where are we going to pay this from? We, we don't have an appropriation for this. Well, what's this? And I said, oh, that's the new uh, 32B, not that one. That's your new liability. Yeah. I mean, there's, a, anyone that, there's, there's individual, and then there's, there's a couple. You know, and there's family, and there's family plus, and there's something else. I think the Mass Government Finance Officials meeting next month is going to talk about this topic. So I'm going along with uh, Glenda and Anthony Barron and the auditors. So yeah, it's definitely. It's a hot topic. It, yeah, it's very, because it's 90-10, 50-50, you know, the proration. Um, a lot of talents are fighting. Hmm. Would you send me this bill? I'm going to send you a bill. Cover <laughs> <laughs> better. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, you want to be able to not only know that you're billing the right amount, but be able to reconcile what they bill you to make sure right. they're back there correct. Right. Correct. Well, it also raises some issues as we do shared services. I see Steve sitting there, but you know we're in some shared arrangements with other towns for shared services, and if the employees in Northampton, you know, there's these ongoing right, that's costs. Some Later on, their for their health insurance. So we have the health nurse, the Steve, and board of health. We do some yeah. shared programs with other communities. So yeah, they're Northampton employees, but they are yeah. building department does the building department too. Building, yeah. I, I, I think it falls under what retirement system you're in. So like that shared service, like the veteran the thing is to be your, you couldn't go back and bill Amherst for when you retired, say. Right. So it's, it's 
fall under where your retirement lies. Right. Or their check. That's why we're looking at the hell is going to figure this out. Well, we're looking at the assessment. <laughs> so why well, haven't? Yeah, it's it's, it's going to get common. You're one fine. You have one person. It's it's three four years out. Oh, I. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> who, who will be in the, in the in the state at the state level? Is there? Well, the retirement systems are uh, obligated to form the treasurer I think, by I don't know the day it's after the fiscal year closes, but you have to January twelfth to fill it out. So in that time frame, the retirement system has to tell the treasurer this is the amount. Here's, here it is, and then you have to fill it. Um, but. When you have one is there employee, approval process for these bills is there? I believe the retirement system's supplying it to the treasurer. That's what you're relying upon there. Because you're getting it from the system. When someone transfers into your system, they're coming in, their, their records are... So if someone comes into Northampton Retirement System, in the Northampton Retirement System, you know where they came from. So you have the information there in their years. And and the prorated portion is already figured out because they're already prorating your retirement to those systems as well. So, but Glenda Stoddard's really been the key person on, for us that's been dealing with this. So I, I, I think if you want more information, I'd have to get her to really, because she's gone into this a lot more. So. Well, Tom, that's why it's always good to do it. You know, you have one person, you know, if you establish the controls, when you have one person, yeah. okay, we're going to flow a receivable through. Then you have to make sure these towns are paying you. So you want to get that receivable on the general ledger. You don't want to do it off the general ledger. So if you have uh, I have a few communities in mind, Northampton not being one, but if you rely on one person to bill, you, know, yeah. you want a second set of eyes that are, are they billing, are they paying? So if you set a receivable on your ledger, so you say Chris Pyle, you set it up to the so communities, that receivable's there, and then um, Susan's eyes can be on it, the mayor's eyes can be on it. Or reading your financials saying, wow, this receivable's not going down, these people paying. And then, oh, are we billing? So I think that's important, getting the receivable on your other financials. Hmm. So Chris will have his own yeah, line item in the budget. Correct. Yeah, yeah. 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 Appropriate. Correct. Line item. Uh, he always wanted that. Oh. Excellent. There would be more or less. Yeah, I'm, I'm not worried about I'm not worried about the revenue. I'm worried about the expense. Right. Mm -hmm. You get hit with a bill, you have it in your appropriation. Where are you gonna? Um, and probably it's gonna take several years to kind of get a balance of what do you think it's gonna be every year. Well, right. it gets really complicated too because the spouse could be on there and the original employee could die. So now you're getting a bill for a spouse, and you're still and you're right. like not even sure Correct. what employee this was for. So it's gonna get it's gonna get very. And when is this going into? It went into effect January 1st. It passed, the state passed it as part of the 2011 budget, so it got passed July 1st, 2010. And it came effective January 1st, 2011. I mean, it's, it's, it's sound. I mean, it makes sense. It's sound, but it's just an administrative the, nightmare. The practice. The theory's great. The theory's great. <laughs> so that's that's not fair. I understand exactly why it was done. Yeah, it's not fair that we would have to pay the whole freight for something. Correct. But they work for somebody else, you know, healthcare wise. I get yeah. that part, it's just how do you figure it out? It's, it's the practice piece. Yeah. Yeah. Budget for it. Well, isn't that the Commonwealth? It's a good idea, you guys figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. We'll pass it, you figure it out. <laughs> well, that's why. There's a cost involved in this for the city, too. There. Mm -hmm. I mean, a cost, an administrative cost, not just the cost for what? Oh, yeah, and all that. Definitely someone's job description just got increased. <laughs> I have a friend that's in the uh, Los Angeles retirement system, and his current spouse was acquired too late to get the benefits. So not only do they keep track of spouses, but they keep track of when that spouse joined the system. Really? Because he's had three spouses. You know, he's been retired longer than he worked there. Sure. But this one, <laughs> this one, this one, this one came on the scene past benefits. So, right. so when he goes, so goes the liability. She doesn't get anything. Out of it, so. You really got to keep track of it in great detail. Los Angeles, you say? There you go. <laughs> well, good luck, Susan, right? Yes. Resolution. Yeah, definitely, definitely. That's, that's an encouraged meeting, the GFOA, anything you can, any kind of feedback. I mean, I've been trying to go to meetings, it's the same. 
arguments, you know, hopefully someone will lay out some practice. Um, I mean, those arguments are brought up. No one can answer them. I mean, those. We'll be getting into case law here on retirement. Well, an ideal situation would be if we ever got to a state or national health care system where, yeah. where we, every community was in the GIC or was right. in a unified state health system, then it could all be just administered by the state. Right. Yeah. You, can, you can see the benefits if you're part of one GIC. It'd just be yeah. like um, not the subject. There's there's there's, there's um, ERP money that you're getting for uh, retirees' costs. Um, the GIC is administering all that. Exactly. It, it flows nice, and they just pass it on to their communities. Um, so there are advantages. Those type of things. Um, yeah, that's mm -hmm. just one. Uh, next up, so that's the end of the current year comments, which is a good uh, prior year. Uh, the water and sewer accounts, uh, which is like uh, the variance didn't change uh, by MTRA amount, but again, it's like it, uh, procedures in place, which I know uh, the city auditor's department, uh, they are addressing the issue as time for field work. They um, are implementing procedures, and I know I got a couple of phone calls already. Um, so those procedures are being put in place to balance that. Um, and then old receivable balances, did you have old personal property bills out there as outstanding? Um, again, you got to go through the abatement process, um, and that takes the overlay. Um, to understand why it's not being done, um, that's one area. That's more of a cleanup of, uh, of, your, of your books. Um, Again, you know it exists. Uh, but the, the, it's a very arcane procedure for getting rid of those things. Correct. Yeah. But if you think about how your budget was built on. You put a, you, you raise an allowance on part of your tax recap. Um, you count on that receivable as part of setting that budget that year. Mm -hmm. So yeah, no, it is. A, yeah, but it could be a bill for a desk and a chair. Right. And a calculator for a business that went out of business okay. five years ago, and the person's in parts unknown. Correct. And that's what all of them. <laughs> they're little and they're annoying. Ninety percent. I think probably wouldn't have even <laughs> been worth sending a bill for. But correct. Yeah. Didn't we clean up a lot of those a couple of years ago? We go. We came uh -huh. up short on uh, the overlay. Correct. And we went back. There was a lot of uh, old bills. Yeah. This we is. took that out of overlay surplus. Yep. To cover those. Yeah. It was like two hundred. So a lot. It was two hundred sixty-four thousand dollars. That was a different issue. That was a revenue deficit. Yeah. Revenue deficit. That's what it was. Yeah. Yeah. This is. You have the personal property. Any books is outstanding. And their problem accounts are business went out of business. You have no. Like, yeah, but we. Books. Yeah, but we didn't cover that revenue deficit by the overlay surplus. By the overlay surplus, mm -hmm. and we actually took some of those out, didn't we, David? A yeah. lot of those old pers uh, property tax. Well, on the on the property tax side, you know that's where the a lot of them George cleaned up. You know, we we wound up with the payment. Correct. We took the property and paid it and got the money back. But, you know, Wayne does that a lot. Where he'll buy. Uh, it happened along ninety one, where there are all these little snippets of property left over after they built ninety one. Yeah. And the person said, "Well, you took three quarters of it to Ellen, and I'm not paying it anymore." And it got to be tax title, and Wayne would buy them and pay the bill with money that we get back again and we just get rid of the account. And, okay. yeah. Some of those personal property ones, though, how many communities do you work with that have set a minimum? You know, don't send a bill if it isn't at least so much, so you uh, don't have to. It's about half and half. About half of them is yeah. said. I, I have actually a lot of communities, surprisingly or not, that actually stop billing boat. They thought it was boat excess? Yeah. So but they don't probably, have like a river. Yeah. We have a river. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but it, it, yeah, they just, because those small boat excise for $5, and it got to be a nuisance collecting on yeah. uh, But for personal property, for, you know, if you said, hey, don't bill anything under 50 bucks or something like that. Because a lot of those are little. Correct. And just jamming up the system. Correct. Yeah, so I mean, something to look at, talk to the assessors. Um, but the bigger it is, it more, the more I'm talking about, it's more cleaning up your old receivables on the books. Um, they have built up your reserves. We talked about that. Um, and then Smith Vocational School, net school spending. You're, you're a unique, uh, unique situation. Uh, and technically, you're not meeting net school spending. However, overall, you are. They classify Smith Voc as a 
separate district. Uh, I just think it's important to know the new management when they're coming in. Uh, an issue you might want to get resolved with the ESC. Yes, I'm aware of it. Yeah. Okay. It's just on the phone with Representative Coke on that. Oh, yeah? yeah? I mean, it's definitely it's a unique. It's very and, and DESC understands, everyone understands. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so it's definitely, uh, I thought the city respond to it well. And then establishing the internal audit function. Again, it's your internal controls. You like to see your city auditor uh, you know, perform a little internal audits, um, especially in this economy. Um, I was talking before, you know. Departmental? What's that? Departmental audit? Yeah. Just make sure your departments are, again, your, your, where your major revenue sources are, which is your tax code, do you have controls in place, but we're talking the other revenue streams. Um, you want internal audits, you know, are here. Once you get your policies that you turn over once a week and you're keeping a cash book and you're accounting for all the funds, then go out and check it out, okay, are you? Um, you know, if you have payroll procedures, are you abiding by the payroll procedures? So it's not big money, it's just embarrassing when it runs a month. Correct. <laughs> like uh, soda cans and some coke or whatever the problem used to be. All right. Uh, you know, if there's any questions, um, yeah. <laughs> regular internal audits. Yeah. Is that the one where you're just on? Mm -hmm. How often? What do you, how often? Uh, you say, what, what's regular? Uh, one or two departments a year. Um, you may you may pick the treasurer's office on every other year, saying, I want to look at your bank records, see what your balance on your on your outstanding checklist, and go through them. May pick the building, the, the parking. Make go to are you, how you're balancing the kiosk machines. I want to see how you're balancing. Um, are, you, are you using them? Uh, using the tapes to to balance. Uh, I'm going to go check a few because it's your internal control structure, and you want to you know we're, you know we're coming in once a year opining on your financial statements. We're doing a lot of analytics. Um, we're looking at, at your major revenue sources. Um, sometimes the minor ones, you know, they're 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 publicly sensitive on, on, on those issues. Yeah. That's really what your internal audit function. Um, I mean, to do it all at once would be quite a job. Correct. Yeah. Okay. And again, you know, when you're, when you're in the day-to-day -day operations, you can pick up a lot more things. You know, when you really look at the numbers and do internal audits. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Did you have a question? No, he answered some of it. <laughs> yeah, of course, at the same time, don't take this a lot of information to look at. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was hoping at some point, like we're coming to finance committee tonight, that these were given to us earlier so we could have at least looked at this. Right. Yeah, probably. Yeah. I think it's a good idea. Oh, yeah, I, I think I rushed to get it, to Susan to get it for setting it for March. I think I, I, think I kind of rushed the envelope on that. East Hampton well, we was dismayed to hear we had ours first. So <laughs> I said East Hampton was dismayed that we got ours before they did. Oh. So, but Tom really, because of the bond, we had to have a lot of the financial statements for the bond uh, prospectus in January. So a lot of this done. happened a little faster than it usually does. Oh. And I'm usually here like in the springtime. Like that was springtime for me. Well, it's good spring all the spring time. That's true. It was not for Blake. These audits will be um, on the website as well. They get posted to the mayor's page. So as of tomorrow, they'll be posted. And the reason that the, this is the first time I've seen the federal. Oh, yeah, yeah, I can tell you the first one. Yeah, the, yeah, please, just for a minute before we let you run out of here. Oh, yeah, no, no problem. Uh, the federal piece is uh, if you receive, if you, if you expend over half a million dollars in federal funds, you have to have a thing called the single audit, the OMB A133. Uh, what it does is it focuses just on federal grants, and you have to test at least 50% of the federal expenditures in accordance with a compliance supplement that's issued by that department. And the pages three, four, five, and six is a listing of all your federal programs of the city. In total, 6.3 million um, on page six. So we have to test. We have to test about 3.3 million um, of federal grants, 
And then those grants are identified on page 10 of which ones we tested um, into the categories of the compliance supplement. And when my memory serves me right, um, you only had one federal finding in all of Basically, it's your school grants and your HUD grants are being tested in compliance supplement, and you only had one federal finding in compliance with the programs. And in my opinion, it's pretty immaterial. It was you have to fill out time and effort certifications when you work on a federal grant. Um, if you're full time, you have to do a month. If you're if you're full time, you have to do it biannual, and if you're part time, you have to do it monthly. Um, you're doing it biannual for both. So. Again, the, this kind of, uh, you know, you're in violation of that, that compliance, so we have to write it up. Um, but again, right when we pointed out to the school department, they, they tested them. So you, you do this if we do it, if we have over half a million dollars? Yep, and that's what forces you to do, have an audit of your financials. This is like a byproduct of, an, of, an, of your audit, your financials. So, so CDBG is in here? Correct, yep. Okay, yep. Yep. Somewhere, I'm sure. Yeah, on page 10, that, that will list. Uh, so that would put us over the top anyway. Yeah. Okay. And you have to, you go through a matrix of uh, risk assessment of your federal program. Um, you look at people change hands, what money, like ERA, anything that had ERA attached to it was automatically a high risk program, no matter what you had to test it. So uh, page 10 is the actual programs that we tested and that we give an opinion on uh, over compliance. But it's always interesting to see how much federal money flows through. I mean, 6.4 million, some uh, hefty federal funds that flow through. Uh, you look at HUD, they're on page uh, one. The total uh, for the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban is 2.3 million. If you had a major finding in here, I'd probably lead off with that, eventually. Okay. You know, um, <coughs> so, so what do we have to, is there there's something we have to file with this? Yep, uh, yep. Uh, do you do electronically now? You used to have to send them to a federal clearinghouse. Now it's all electronically. I load them into a system. I send them to Susan. She goes in, she has a signature code. She signs out the clearinghouse, and then it comes back to me. And I put my signature code in, and then it gets submitted, and then we should get it back on next week. It should take about seven days. But you are all in the federal clearinghouse now. You can go, you can go on uh, the federal clearinghouse website and type in Northampton, and you'll see the data collection form typed in and all the findings, if there's any. So, um, so this is just policy. There's no, there's no upside or downside. It's just something we have to send the paperwork in. If you had a federal finding, that would be a downside, yes. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, okay. Thank you. No problem. I'm sure I'll have. To. Oh, it's okay. Your number's on the front here. That's right. I'll read it. You know, there is one. Uh, <laughs> let me just. Is your whole number on there? <laughs> my wife killed it. <laughs> I did pass out my whole number. The fax number one time. <laughs> oh, on page 10 of this report, I just want to point out just one thing because I. This question on page 10 says, Oddity qualified as a low risk oddity? No, we put that's because you had a federal finding. And it allows all that is, is <clears throat> it allows us to, instead of testing 50% of expenditures, we can drop it down to 25%. But if you look, your 6.3, well, we're going to test HUD every year because it's a major program, and we're going to test school grants title one every year. So you're those two like, problems we're always going to test because they're considered high risk anyways because of era funding and just, I, I mean, I'd have to have a head exam if I came to the city and not tested HUD. I mean, that's just a, a, a major program of the city. So you're over the 50%. Um, so I always like to point that out to people. It doesn't mean like you're, you're marked bad at the federal government that you're not a low risk oddity. So the, this, this, this designation would not have an impact on future applications? No. No, it's really the nature of the federal finding. You know, if you, if you, miss, if you misspent a 1.2 million HUD expenditures or something that wasn't meant for, yeah, that, that would happen, but you don't have that. Right. And dollar threshold is the between type A and type B programs. 
Yeah, that is, um, as we edgy, the way we look at it, a major program is anything over 300,000, and then we have to just assess that 300,000 over again and test. Yeah. So that's why Major Arc HUD is over 300,000, so that's a type A program. So we have to hit that once every three years. And you know, all your school grants, your Title I is over 300,000. So we're going to test with all, so you have to test half of the type A programs. Yeah. So you're, even if you qualify as a low risk guardy, we'd still hit we'll 50%. Yeah, you still got to do it. Okay. Any other questions for Mr. Scanlon? Or can we nope. Release him today? All right. Okay. Happy birthday tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's yes, right. and you're the same for your daughter. That's right. I got her a set of earrings, so she's all cool. Yeah. And th these are extra. Oh, great. Sure, we'll leave those. Those. Yeah, yeah, just give them the other thing. Earrings at two years old? She's <laughs> eight. <laughs> okay, um, I note that Mr. Connor is here, so I was just going to move down and just pick up um, the uh, number six. Um, we were just going to have him give, give us just a preview because, as I said at the last meeting, we're going to bring forward on Thursday a transfer. Um, it's actually going to be two hundred thousand um, into his budget from free cash. So if you don't want to give us an update on on where you are as we get to the end of the fiscal year, and thank you. Should I stay here? Um, yeah, as as we went into the fiscal year. Um, we finally made a big jump. Um, uh, Mayor Claire Higgins had budgeted me much more than we had previously um, because we finally were starting to balance out. Um, I was hoping to have a chart for you guys, and uh, I tried to scan it, or Karen tried to scan it to get it to me. Um, it didn't really work. But it kind of shows you on, <coughs> that's us from 2001. And it just goes up. I can provide it for Thursday if people would like it. Um, but it's just, this is all the other communities. This is us. Um, so uh, it was data that I had gotten from the DVS office that, you know, they said, you know, don't tell anybody where you got it. But I just did. Um, but it was just kind of showing us how we're working. And we had last year anticipated... Last year, I think we did 650000 in paid out benefits. This year, um, I was hoping it was going to level out. It's still May because we had a bunch of expenses this winter um, that will not, you know, be regular. Um, so I'm hoping and believing that it's possible that the 200 is going to get us through the rest of the year, which would get me just around 600, a little over 600. But again, in this, um, I didn't anticipate paying for seven burials this year either, and that's one of the requirements. I've already run out of my um, budget. I usually budget for five burials a year. How much is each burial? $2,000. 2000 Right. They can have a funeral up to 3000 and um, we will give up to 2000 If it goes over 3000 then, you know, hands off, we don't do it. But, um, and unfortunately, we, we've had a, um, a rough winter. You wouldn't think weather-wise, but we have lost, um, like I say, seven of our veterans. Um, and they're indigent, so they need their funerals paid for. Steve, on that on the burials, you're saying that the city gives the two thousand dollars. Yes. But you'll go up to three thousand. In other words, if there's an indigent veteran, and say he has a, a sister down wherever, um, you know, if he has no life insurance and he has no savings, then you know, it's tough for some of these families um, to cover the cost of this funeral. So what happens to the funeral home applies with us. The family, or if there's any money left in the person's checking account, can go towards it. But we will only give 2000 even though it can be as much as $3,000. Um, it often doesn't happen, but there are times where, you know, the family is willing to, you know, throw in some. But most of the time, a lot of these veterans have been alienated from their families. So, 
their, um, you know. Is that cost of just cremation? No, actually, we're pretty lucky. We have the funeral homes here in Northampton do a very good service um, for little amounts of money. They're not really making much on it, but they do it as a service to our veterans. Also, the veterans can get uh, interred down in um, Agawam for free if they're an eligible veteran. So that, um, that saves a lot. That's great that to way. hear that. So. So I'm, I'm trying to figure this. The, the plateau that we talked about last at the, the last meeting. Right. It, you don't know if, if we're if we're there or not. Or it, it, it's hard to tell. What I, I, I and I guess I think I still think we're kind of at a plateau, um, but it's hard to know it for sure just financially. But our cus our our uh, client base is staying around the same. In a six-month period, I'm having about 250 people I'm helping, all right? Um, but some of, those, some of that help can be more expensive than other. Um, if I'm assisting a, a veteran who is up at Soldier On, that's a whole lot different than a veteran who's about to lose their house because of mortgage arrearages. That's a bigger chunk of money to help them out. Yeah. There are two things that are relieving me this year, or one big one that's really helping me this year, it's called the SSVF grant, and it's Social Services for Veteran Families. It was done by the VA, and it was money uh, that was, you know, people put in their grants to nonprofits. Soldier On did, Vet Inc. did. Vet Inc. got New England. Soldier On got uh, part of a big chunk of New York State. It's basically money, if somebody needs money to get out of homelessness or are at risk of being homeless, they can get their money. And their threshold is higher than mine, so it can help more people. It's just getting the access to that money. And they only have one person who handles four counties, so uh, she's got to work it out for it. But if my memory is right, this 200000 will bring us up to, what, 640000 or something this time? Is it 640 or $605,000? i am not, a, it could be 640 Last year we spent 650 so, yeah, we so I'm. So the yeah, we we budgeted about four hundred thousand because we've spent four fourteen as of today. Okay. So, okay. so right. and we're spending the le for eight months we're spending fifty two thousand a month roughly the average. Yeah. So this should get us. So we should be about leveled off. I have I already have a chart, Steve. Okay. That has all of this, and I have put that together. So I can share right. that. Okay, so we're going to be right at the same point we were last year. I'm, I'm hoping that we stay at that level. So that's what we're going to I'm getting money to help our, that. our anticipated plateau. The other good news, and that's if it passes, which I think it will, in the governor's budget, he has put in that um, veterans who are in shelters or in transitional residence, which would mean soldier on or at um, Cherry Street, um, VA program, yeah. the cities and towns are going to get reimbursed 100%. I have been begging for that for seven years. I've been on the job for eight, and I've been on it for seven. The biggest reason is, is that a veteran comes in, they become a resident of Massachusetts through Northampton. Two weeks, two months later, they go to Bedford VA for a program, Brockton VA, they have their own dorms or their homeless shelters, or they go to New England and Boston. Those communities say, well, he's yours for a year. He was a resident of Northampton for two weeks. How come he's mine? You know, but that's the way the law was written or the regulations were written. And those communities would sit there and say, yeah, because they don't want to spend the money. They don't want to contribute to 25%. Our budgets are, you know, oh, you know. So... What happens is, is now with this 100% reimbursement, I can, they go to Bedford, I can call up Bedford and say, guy's there, he's yours. Oh, I don't, yeah, you do, because you're getting it all back. Right. Because I can't case manage somebody on the other side of the state. Right. So that was like taking advantage. And in a way, I mean, but that's the way the regs were written, and so there was nothing we could do about it. So this is going to save us, and we're going to get 100% back now. So that's um, what you were talking about on the reimbursement. Right. I saw you. Yep. That's great. Now, the 100% is not just for the shelter vets, solar water chairs, that's for everything. That's no, no, no. No, that's just, that's just that, to solve that problem. 
That's to solve that particular problem. The rest of our I'm community. Excited there for a minute. Well, and the other side of looking at it, where you know they give a hundred percent back then they would sit there and say, well, why do you need a local VSO? Why don't we make them state workers? So you've turned it into what DTA is today. Yeah. Now, DTA is now a state agency. It used to be in that building right there. And it was a split between city and state. So you had local people dealing with what we'll think. If it went to 100% reimbursement, then eventually somebody would sit there and say, well, why do you have to have a local VSO? We'll just have state office, which then says, oh, and you'll have one in Northampton. And then five years after that, they'll say, oh, sorry, you don't get it. You can go to Hoyoke or you can go to Greenfield, which then you're not treating veterans differently. You're not giving them the respect of being able to go in mm -hmm. to their local person who's a veteran. That's one of the reasons why you don't really want 100% reimbursement, because it'll do away with the program as it exists. And that means community uh, contact. I can help somebody through the city of Northampton within days. Try to do that at the state level. Doesn't happen. So, but at least the transient people who are in and move on, um, we're going to get 100% back. So that will be helpful. Do you have to track where they went? Do I now? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 And I had one woman, she has been in four different places in four months. So, you know, I didn't get a check. Well, where? Where we are sent you? it, and she goes, oh, I moved to da 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 this program. It's like, what if they so, leave the Commonwealth? Then they're not eligible. So it stops if they leave the Commonwealth. Yeah. Uh, Steve, the um, governor's budget, would that go back retroactively? No. Or, so it would only be from... July 1st is coming in. Yeah, FY13. Claims filed after that date yeah. would then right. be eligible for the 100%. Okay. Yeah. See, I'm not the only one that was dreaming. <laughs> and I'm, I'm hoping that you, uh, I'm actually supposed to be at work right now. I just did a radio show. Uh, but I also work on Thursday nights for, this is my last month doing it. So I was hoping to be able to answer your questions today. So I hope I don't need to come back on Thursday because it's right in my... That's why I wanted so, you to come in today. Great. So, uh, Hopefully. For C and, okay. Those are pretty used to these transfers. Yeah. I'm just happy it's 200 and not 300. So yeah. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Would it be too much to ask of some form of memo for the, just a memo, just a brief paragraph explaining mm -hmm. sure. the requests so the, the other counselors can get those as well? Yeah, I can do that. And, and we can look at our charts and see what information you have and I have. Yeah. You should be able to graph. You have that. Yeah, I have a chart. And chart. Yeah, and I and I've got all the numbers for this year. So if you have time tomorrow, so please just stop over. Yeah. Yep. A memo and a picture. Yeah, that's, that's great. There you go. So we'll cover it. Okay. All right. So we're not going to vote on this tonight. I just wanted to give everyone a preview, and then it'll come before we have Thursday. Great. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and are we? We need to do two readings. We kind of need to do two readings on Thursday because, as Susan said, we're we're already in the red. Yeah. So, so all my benefits, all my vets can get their money on the fifteenth. Yeah. So that'll just to give you a heads up on that. We'll be asking for a series two readings. But I'll write something up. Thank you both. Thank you. Okay. So um, jumping back up to the normal order, uh, we'll go to number four, which is a an update on the Florence Community Center. And uh, as you know, um, the school department has uh, decided that they no longer have a use for it um, and voted to surplus it. And so now it'll fall under central services. Um, luckily, uh, from her days at the school department, Susan is intimately familiar with the Florence. It's, it's chasing her. She, she thought she was done with it, and now it's come back. So. Uh, so she can give us a quick overview. David uh, Pomerantz sent a letter to tenants. The plan is to renew their leases, um, and they're going to see not a lot of changes because the same woman who's been managing the building, we're going to have her continue to manage the building, uh, Tracy Harity, and so they'll have a same contact person. And um, I think as I mentioned to you, my plan uh, was to try to now I think we should study this and decide is there a, do we foresee there being some kind of a city use for the building? Um, so what I'd like to do is put together a committee 
um, probably just a, a, a small committee that would have probably representation from this committee, from the property committee, um, including, you know, probably someone who also represents that area, uh, and then maybe put together a couple of someone possibly from the foreign civic and business, maybe someone from one of the abutting properties, and just, I don't know, get together, take a look at it, take a tour through it, talk to David Pomeranz, we can have David Pomeranz give an overview of the capital needs of the building, and then I think um, we just, I think then that can start a conversation for us about what we foresee the uses of the property or whether we want to try to uh, do something with it, whether try to at least find someone to at least the entire thing or sell it or whatever. Uh, and as you all know, there's also currently an ordinance that's going through, two ordinances going through the process right now. One is to actually rezone the property, um, which actually we, we kind of need because we do have a few tenants in there that are commercial and technically we need to have the office industrial for them to be lawful tenants. Mm -hmm. um, and then the second one is another, another one that deals with the reuse of educational or religious buildings that would give even some flexibility above and beyond the, the, um, the new zoning that we'd be placing this in for a future redevelopment of the building. So, um, so I don't know if you want to go quickly over any other details about it, the financials or... There, um, there's 22 rentable spaces there. We have 16 occupied and six vacant. Um, when the high school had the alternative high school program, the first floor was used for that. And then when they moved that program back to the high school, um, they've been out of the, the school department's been out of that building now for two years. So the spaces on the first floor um, were available for rent, but we were only able to rent one of them. And that's because every year the superintendent was like, don't rent to anybody for more than a year because I might want to put a special ed program back there. So every person who came to me and wanted to move their business to Northampton into this location said, well, if you can't guarantee me this space more than a year, I'm not going to relocate my business. Mm -hmm. So the first floor spaces up until this year, with the school department kind of being in limbo about it, were not very attractive. Second floor, you know, the school department would not have used that because there's no handicapped access. Mm -hmm. So the second floor has always been good to rent. Um, we only have one vacancy on the second floor. Uh, four vacancies on the first floor and then one in the basement. So there's a mix of tenants, um, a lot of nonprofits um, like Habitat, the Pioneer Valley Habitat for Humanities there. Um, we have Casa Latina, um, Valley Free Radio, mm -hmm. and then there's a number of um, commercial tenants, mass commercial cleaning, um, audio visual visual archives, the Shang Shang Institute, some yoga, some dance lessons, some musicians. So it's a nice mix. Um, the building always paid for itself when the school department had it. Um, the year that I started keeping records um, in 06, um, total cost to maintain the building were 77000 And we brought in $96,000 in rent. So we had a little surplus there. Uh, in 07, we brought in, we spent $92,000 and we brought in $96,000. Um, 08, we spent 98 and brought in 104. So the first couple of years, we were doing pretty good. Um, in 09, we started to spend more than we were bringing in. In 09, we um, spent 102 and brought in 100. In 10, we spent 79 and brought in 100. So we had a good year. And then the last two years in the school department, we have just about broken even. Um, in 11, we brought in 105, and we spent 104. Um, and in, uh, let's see, in 11, um, I told you 11, and in 12 so far, looks like we're on track to just about break even by $200. So we don't want to lose any tenants in this building, um, because if we do, then we're going to have to start taking over that. There's a little bit of a surplus. Um, the uh, surplus that they had in this account at the end of fiscal 11 was $45,000. But that's all the money there is if there's a broken heating system or anything. So if the heating system had to be replaced, we would have to, everyone will have to leave because the cost of that will be so expensive. So 
the benefit to us is to keep the building at a, at a level where it's paying for itself, even if it's only marginal. So the recommendation is to not raise rents there for fiscal 13. Um, the school committee has always been the one who set the rents, and now that the building belongs to the city, it, it's always belonged to the city, but now it's under the control of the city, um, I'm recommending that you don't increase the rents um, for fiscal 13. I think we'll be fine as far as we'll break even. If we don't break even, we've got this $45,000 cushion in there. And I think if we raise the rents, we run the risk of losing some tenants, and then we would be looking at potential um, ending the year in the red. Or at least after the first year, we might, might end up in the red after we go through this little surplus. So Now the rents were last changed. Um, school committee increased the rents in FY11 for 3%, by 3%. So they were not increased in FY12, and we're recommending they not be increased in FY13. Um, there's two different rates. There's a rate for nonprofits, and there's a rate for for-profits. And every year when I used to do this analysis for the school department, I would call Terry Anderson and ask her what the square footage rates, rental rates were for, for a similar space in Florence. And so these have always typically been below. Um, right now, the current rate um, for nonprofits is, if you're on the ground floor, which is the basement, it's eight twenty-five per square foot annual cost, and then for for-profits, um, it's nine thirty, and then on the first and second floor, again for nonprofits, it's eight twenty-five, and for the first and second floor for the for-profits, it's nine eighty. So there's a little bit of a different price structure between for-profits and non-profits. And I think those rates were in line. They're cheaper than uh, arts and industry building. And um, they include all utilities. So it's a pretty good That's deal. A good deal. Uh, most of the rooms rent for about, the average is about six fifty a month if you've got a, uh, a classroom that's about 800 square feet. Mm -hmm. Do you have a sense of the worth of the building, the market value or anything? I think that would be one of the things that the committee, I would probably want to take into account whether we want to um, order an appraisal, you know, seek an appraisal on it to get a sense of what yeah. the value mm -hmm. is. Um, I think that would be all of the pieces we want to look at. And then and then, you know, ultimately this committee owns, the, you know, we own this com the property committee, or we're the, we have the property committee function, so it would be up to us. We're now the landlords, like the school committee was, and so we, it would be up to us to make a decision going forward. Do we want to keep it? Do we want to sell it? Do we want, you know, what do we want to do? So I think I'd like to take this time now to keep the current tenants in place for one more year and let's do an analysis so we can say to the taxpayers, you know, we've, we've looked at this, it doesn't make a lot of sense. I mean, my, own, my own personal bias is I, you know, I don't want to be in the property holding business unless we've got some need for it. Mm -hmm. um, but I'd rather just, you know, I don't have like a burning desire to dump the building. I just, yeah. what I do have is I know the building inside and out mm -hmm. and it's, um, it's old. It it's got a lot of issues. Yeah. It has abatement issues. Um, mm -hmm. the, the, um, the boiler system and the windows are the two biggest things. And if you correct those, you reach a threshold where you actually have to do more um, handicapped accessibility. All right. So it's kind of like we either have to do something about it at some point or we, or we need to not have it. Mm -hmm. So we'd really have to, f we'd have to have a fairly pressing municipal need for the building to put yeah. that kind of money in. I'm, I'm really leaning towards, towards you know, unloading the piece of property. Okay. Um, but it's not like something I'm really passionate about. I just don't want to spend a lot of money on it. And, and, it's, and it's going to happen. It nice needs a lot. It's nice to see it on the tax rolls. It most certainly would. Yeah. We did not include this in the ESCO, um, so no energy performance measures were right. done there. And they did do an analysis, and I think the payback on them was just so huge. Um, and we also weren't sure we wanted to incur debt for this building because even when it was on the school side, it was kind of like nobody nobody really had had a long term plan. We were reaching the point if we did that where we would have to make ADA. There was a lot of things we had to do with the building, so yeah, I remember that we had that discussion. So are are folks in agreement with the idea of just trying to put together a small reuse committee to look at it to analyze it? Definitely, um, absolutely. And 
so uh, maybe a couple of members of this committee, and then I can I'm sure Mr. Pomerantz would be willing to provide data and all that, and then we could reach out to other people in the community. I could ask Florence Civic and Business yeah. whether they would appoint someone. The Congregational Church and I was gonna, may have a good I had a, person. There. I had a yeah. contact there that I was going to reach out to, who also lives in the neighborhood, that yeah. might want to serve on it. Um, and then I don't know, I don't want to make it huge, a big thing, yeah. Um, yeah. but just be able to do an analysis and then come back to this committee and say, this is what we think. We're talking three, four, five people. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah exactly. Okay. Part of that once upon a time when we had a property committee separate, I, I chaired that committee. We presided over the building at the disposition of that. And of course, at the time, that was some time ago, but there was a lot of community emotional attachment to the building. Mm -hmm. Now, that may have dissipated in time for, for obvious reasons, but the fact is that the prospect of selling it and demoing it and leveling it and turning it into something new, of course, might that would probably prompt a rather emotional response when a lot of people went there as, as kids in school. And then subsequently people would get probably got to go alumni right here. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, that's what I'm saying is that in, in that actually drove a lot of the decisions that we were, when we were discussing about this 15 years ago. But there's a limit. Well, we did, no, well, we'll yeah, go that, and, that, really and, that's, yeah. and that's, but I'm just, it's, it's, I'm just red flagging that as a conversation point that mm -hmm. that will be part. And that's of why it. I wanted yeah. to have some community yeah. participation on yeah. that. Yeah. And so I, and like, if you, if there's, if you can think of somebody that would be really good, who still lives in the community, is there a former educator at the school that you can think of that it might that still? <laughs> They're all dead. <laughs> yeah. Mrs. Lives. Deck, I think, was the last one. I don't think she, she just passed away. She just passed away. Yeah. I'm just trying but, to think of somebody that has that. But, but you know, I don't think the building lacks viability. You know, yeah, I don't. I don't think it's a scorched earth situation here. It's it's I a tough it, structure, though. but it's ready for. It's a split level, and that's. But well, it's, yeah, it's gonna it's gonna the reinvestment in that thing would be a substantial investment. I mean, so would demolition. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not gonna come down easy. We have worked with Alex and I and the council mm -hmm. on the school building. Right. The little schoolhouse. Oh, the little schoolhouse in the yes. cemetery. Yes. And I th I thought the way that was done. Well, then we also established the rules that any surplus city property, if it were to go to a 501c3, that there'd be a pilot yeah. attached yeah. to it. The firehouse right. taught us that lesson. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Just where I work right now. <laughs> <laughs> but that, yeah, so, yes, and that came up all, that was, that came out of the property committee discussions relative to um, mm -hmm. that school, and South Street School, and yeah. Yeah. Burn Street School. So then we'll so I'll I'll um, I'll put that together ASAP and we'll get working on it and it can even take a little bit of time into the spring and summer and then nice we can, to we can yeah if we're extending the rents for another year it'd be nice to have an answer so we know what we're doing before we have to do that again exactly yeah uh, Fran Tilly uh, Fred Tilly's daughter lives on North Maple Street I think Fred Tilly was the principal there for. Mm -hmm. 41 years, I think, or something. Such foolish number as that. Okay. Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll ask her. Yeah, I, th I, think it, I, I think Bill's point is well taken. So yeah. if you could find somebody that has some attachment to the school, that yeah. would be good to have them there. Good. Yeah. So. And she's also a teacher. Mm -hmm. There you go. Um, okay. current, a current yeah. teacher. I think she's teaching in Williamsburg now. Okay, well, that's yeah. good. Okay. She's right. authorized. Yeah. So I'll follow up with you on that, yeah. and we'll get that together, and you know. I have one, one thing to add, just in case you you hear this, that what there are school employees that are going to still be providing services there, but their their um, salaries are paid out of this revolving fund. So um, there is a 25% uh, custodian uh, that works there. She does the custodial for the bathrooms and everything, and she's still going to do that. And her salary has been and will continue to be for that 25% out of this revolving fund. Mm -hmm. And uh, as David mentioned, uh, Tracy Harity is the property manager. And again, her even though she's based in the school department, her hours have been and will continue to be out of this fund. So even though it's going to look like the school department's still supporting the building, those salaries have always been separate and will continue that way. It just made sense to keep these same people in place. It was part yeah. of their work structure, and, and so that, that, that worked out fine with the superintendent. So. Okay, 
So um, the other issue, which is again another property committee issue, is we have the farmers market policy, um, which we, uh, which Terry Anderson presented to us. Um, it went to the Board of Public Works uh, because they control obviously um, certain parts of city property, and then. Um, the idea was that our committee, uh, acting as the property committee, would give its endorsement of the policy. Um, and we, uh, you will note that there's a fee that's moving through the council right now, which is the fee that this policy says we should establish. So we're trying to get that moving. And the other thing is, we're hearing from the farmers markets that because of the weather, they want to actually get started earlier. So they're itching to like apply for, you know, the two markets want to apply and get going early. So um, so that ordinance will go, um, has, I think it's come back to every, it's come back to us. So we'll take a first reading on it and then a second reading on the 15th. So my question for you is um, the only change, there's not really been any changes to the policy per se other than there were a couple of like open-ended questions that Terry put in there, meaning you'll have to set an ordinance fee. So we'll, we, Lynn in my office uh, put in that the annual fee shall be $50 as set by ordinance. They had given us a range somewhere between 25 and 100 and we just chose 50. Okay. Um, the, other, the other piece that we were gonna clarify is they had it listed that basically Terry Anderson would be the contact point and we said that we just put the language that the mayor shall designate a city employee as the farmer's market liaison. It had been the director of economic development, but we didn't want to be that specific since we don't currently have a director of economic development. So that we just basically said that the mayor's office would have a liaison. Um, and then the only other thing in the policy, uh, just trying to, I think those were the only two that were kind of left, that, that she had just kind of left um, open. Uh, yeah, well, there's just, yeah, the, it's, again, the whole thing about the economic development director. Um, I think those are the only two that needed some kind of filling in of the blanks. Yeah, there's no other yellows on here. So the question is, would you want to um, give your endorsement of this policy now, or do we want to wait? We can actually wait until uh, the second reading on the fee, and we could do it that night at finance committee that night. I mean, I don't know. Well, what's the fee? I thought it was fifty dollars. It's, it's fifty, but that requires a separate ordinance. Okay. So okay. there's a separate ordinance working through that we'll have to take a first and second reading okay. on. Can okay. I ask a question about that? Isn't, isn't there, are there standards and regulations for fee assessment, and the fee has to be appropriate? To the administrative costs and nothing more. Mm -hmm. And they uh, they determined in their study that if it was somewhere, you know, they, they basically gave us a range that they felt was a reasonable cost. That would, um, that would cover the cost of it. it yeah. And actually, as we've looked at it, you know, um, there's a, this liaison person is going to have to figure out what various departments are needed. You know, they all need to go through whether it's BPW or transportation and parking if it's a city parking lot. The other piece that's involved is there are often, as it's spelled out in the policy, um, there are parking meter bags that are involved that they get so many parking meter bags. And so in so probably $50 may even be, you know, not enough, but it's clearly a reasonable fee for, for this service. So, I, so we feel pretty confident that that'll meet that standard. We really kicked that around for a long time. Um, so, uh, so that was the record, and we went. Back, we actually, I didn't want to bring this forward myself, so we actually asked the ad commission to come up with the fee and to put it forward. So the fifty dollars fee was was so voted on by ad commission as a recommendation. So. So we may have to tweak it next year. Yeah, if we find that it's a burden. I mean, right now there's only two licensees, right. so it's fairly straightforward. Um, if we got more and it got more complicated, I suppose we could raise that fee, but um, 50 seemed reasonable. So we vote on, we vote on this for, uh, during our finance in council, so it's on uh, discussions on television? If that would be, yes, we can do that. And essentially it'll just be a motion, I'll ask for a motion of the finance committee to endorse the policy. And, and then it'll come up for Because it's really, it's, uh, it's a policy, yeah. it's not yeah. like it's going in the ordinance books, and yeah. so the two main 
bodies, well, obviously the Ag Commission has endorsed it, and now BPW has endorsed it, so fund property committee is sort of the last one. And I think transportation and parking yeah. prior to it. So Would it help it? Do we have to endorse it at this yeah. meeting now? Why can't we? You, I mean, we put it on. I put it on the agenda as property committee endorsement. It's yeah. really a matter of if you want to do it or you don't want to do it, or if you want to, however you want to do it. Why I'm really we willing to move it forward as soon as we could. Yeah. So why can't we move, move it now? Move it right now. Right. All right. Make a motion. We endorse. Second. Okay. So there's been a motion made and seconded to endorse the policy. Um, any other discussion of it? Okay. So um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. A nay. Okay. So then. We've given it the endorsement, so now the only thing left will be just the setting of the fee, um, which will come, you know, we'll take a first reading on on Thursday and then the 15th. So we could have a discussion if people want to do two readings on the first, that would be fine. I don't know if anyone cares if setting a fee well, is. I think I, it doesn't bother me, yeah. David, because. We're not spending money, it's. We're that's gonna, yeah. right. And I think with the farmers, I mean, that's their living. Mm -hmm. To me, I mean, two votes. Well, I am concerned that two readings on assessing a fee. Oh, I'm not getting Well, I mean, maybe we're setting a fee. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're creating a fee. It's basically in our fee table. We now have to have a fee for farmers market permits. Right. Yeah, so to do two readings to suspend rules to assess a fee, I there is the public might feel within their rights to say that it's objectionable you voted in short order a, a fee that was to be assessed to the community without a second reading. And I could see, I mean, I don't, I, I, two week, that two week period, I don't think it's going to make that big a difference. Yeah, yeah we might have another snowstorm. That's true. Uh, we're supposed to, actually. Yeah. So, uh, but it, we had a lot of, we had a lot of the people that were going to pay that fee that were here. We had a yes. lot of farmers. Oh yeah, no, no, I, I mean, I, I, I say that only as an oh, yeah, initial yeah. process. Yeah. And not, I mean, because I haven't heard any objections. The appearance. Yeah. Yeah. Well, not only the appearance, but the actual spirit of the yeah. intent of two, two readings. So uh, just in keeping with that. Okay. And, and since fine. there doesn't seem to be that pressing, I don't, I'm not sure. That and then if it snows like hell, we've indicated. Yeah, yeah exactly. that's fine. We'll look like she I doubt they're going to get started until <laughs> April anyway. So right. I think, we're, right. I think we're, we'll be fine if we wait till the 15th. So it's fine. Okay. Okay. So, um, Item number six, 2012 update. We did do the one transfer or discuss the transfer. I think the only other update is I think we were going to um, wait until we finish the third quarter and come in and give you, like we did at the end of the second quarter, just look at where we are in terms of expenditures versus what we actually budgeted. Um, so we'll have a better sense of that. Um, and I'm actually hoping we'll see some, some good changes there. Um, we'll see. Uh, uh, the other issue is on 2013. Um, I'm going to at the. Um, I wanted to do it at the finance committee or at the finance committee on Thursday. Give kind of an overview, uh, kind of a budget overview of some of the factors in 2013. So we're going to be doing a presentation. I'll just do a presentation. It's sort of a uh, you know 30,000 foot view of the budget and some of the factors we're dealing with um, and some of the trends that we're dealing with. Um, as a way to kind of kick off the budget season. Um, and then I'll be making that similar presentation at the school committee, um, and then probably the Smithville trustees, and then trying to schedule some community-based ones as well. But I wanted, to, so I didn't want to do anything tonight since I'm going to do it on Thursday. Um, I want to keep you all in suspense. And well, yeah. for PowerPoint, it's, PowerPoint. Well, it's, it's better the televised ones, so better. Exactly, to do it. exactly. And so the budget season just is complete. Yeah, the only thing I will call it, yeah. The only thing I will tell you is, just as an FYI, I did, I met with department heads last week because we had our regular monthly department head meeting, and we also issued kind of a, an opening budget, a memo to them about preparing their budgets. And given the numbers that we know now, we've asked people to submit a level funded, but to begin preparing a budget that's really based on level funding, mm -hmm. because we're, you know, there's not going to, we aren't seeing any increases in chapter 90 or I mean chapter 70 or in other local aid and pretty much what we're projecting as um, you know revenue potential new revenue versus new expenditures are sort of offsetting each other so we're really we're and then we've got the health care thing that's hanging out there um, we did meet with the health care advisory committee we met with health new england 
they walked us through where they're coming up with their quote, and now we've asked them to go back and look at some plan changes, and we're going to try to talk to some other providers. So, so that's uh, so. Anyway, you, if you get some feedback about that, apparently there was a budget and property meeting um, of the school committee last night uh, that was that where that news was not well received. Uh, that I was asking people again. And it says in the memo, preliminary, give us a level funded um, budget. Um, so, and again, that's, that's because I think that's what we need to do to be responsible at this point. Things may change, but that's, that's sort of our opening starting point for people. So, so we have from 12.6 to 12%. Yeah. Well, that, and again, the 12.6 was a, I think they were, so we've got, we've got this oddity where we have sort of two separate health plans right now because the firefighters have their own separate, more expensive plan um, because they didn't want to yeah. take the, the savings just to prove a point. So they, they're, they're, so I think they were basing it on that calculation, which is how they got the 12.6 and then they realized it's actually 12%. Um, so, but there, there, there's a few new plans that they're looking at and some other possible deductions and other changes that we can look at, and there, as well as talking to some other um, other healthcare plans to see what what kind of pricing they might be able to give us. So we'll just keep working on that. Um, it's a moving target, but so. But I have to you know today we have to assume 12% because that's what we have in front of us, and then hopefully we can work our way down from that. So. Million dollars. 1.2, basically. You know, basically, you could figure yeah. 100 grand for each percentage. You know, that's a good yeah. working way to do it. So, yeah. Um, so that's the update uh, on 2013. Uh, don't I don't have any new business items? Are there any new business items? Otherwise, Still a I would announcement. Um, okay. I had a call from uh, 1812 Auto Body today, okay. and um, they want to know just exactly what they can do to help. The Florence Fields. They would make monetary donations. They want to do oh. whatever they can, okay. uh, maintenance or whatever it is. Uh, in they would like to do it in memory of their son who died in 1992 on Brookwood Court in the swimming pool. Mm -hmm. He um, at a party, mm -hmm. okay. in the pool and right. had fractured his neck and he passed away. So anyway, they want to do something in memory of him. Okay. And uh, one more thing too. Kerry Clark has passed away. Yeah. From Florence, he is the architect of the Christmas or holiday lighting, whichever you. Um, and he passed away just the day before yesterday. So sure. yeah. um, we don't know just exactly what to do for this guy, but he has he did all of this under the radar and never wanted recognition. But um, figure somehow we'll get together with David and we'll do something in Florence. Yeah. Um, we don't know just exactly what yet, but the guy was really. The number one volunteer I can think of in Florence. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we can find out about that. I'm sure that there's a way to donate to Florence Fields either through one of the community trust funds or one of those. There's yeah, there definitely should be a way to do it. And they're looking to do something like sustained donation. It could be through the rec department. I'm sure yeah. they're going to have a set up a revolving fund for that account. So there should we should be able to figure out a way to do that. Okay. I also know that there's that part of the plan. You know, they only got funding for. Um, you know, the fields and that there's still the whole gazebo Those and facilities, exactly. you know, the uh, picnic table area mm -hmm. that they're going to be looking for private donors, so that might be okay. a way to do it. So I would say Emory Mojo would be a good mm -hmm. point of contact. Right. Until, any, until I bring it up, so. Yeah. Any, anyone that's interested, uh, the calling hours are Friday, 4 to 7, Saluzniak, and the funeral yeah. is Saturday, yeah. 10 o'clock, at the Florence Congregational Church. Now, David, I should think that the Florence Business Association would be doing something like you were just suggesting. Well, they actually they wanted to have the uh, sort of the, the get together after what, at the Florence Civic, but it's busy, so it's going. They're going to have it at the Garden House after the. Uh, mm -hmm. No, after but the wasn't service. you just saying that so, something should be done to oh, recognize him? Absolutely. Um, we don't, and we haven't figured it out yet. It's too early. We haven't. Um, well, the Florence Business Association. Florence Civic and Business. Oh yeah. Right. So this is a huge hall in Florence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he and his brother renovated that building almost single-handedly. Yep. Yeah. They are actually the sons of Cecil Clark, the former building inspector. Mm -hmm. So anyway. Yeah, and Kerry was actually a city police officer. That's right. Seventies. Yep. Yeah. 
though. 57. 57? 57, 56. Okay. Yeah. All right. Good cancer. I think um, we can adjourn and then we can talk yep. about it. So, motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay.